Skiing, I think, was a social thing at that moment. Yes. Because uh, enjoying more the ski than an adventure. It's more like a social activity to ski. Real Charette made a, made a, uh, a tremendous business out of skiing as a social thing. He, he would get these people in the hotel. He would have the instructors, some living in the hotel, and he would have the instructors be the social director of the class that he gave them, the eight or ten People. students. And he was the social director of that class. He took them skiing, he took them partying, he took them drinking, he took them swimming, he took them... He was the social director of that class. Okay. And, and he, he, he really developed what ski teaching was at that time. And so I tried to bring that mindset to the weekend kids and the mindset to the parents that came uh, during the week. And, and we had, I don't think we had the same success that Real Charette had, but we tried to bring the same kind of thing. Let's go out and have some fun. Let's, let's go out and ski the bumps. Let's go out and ski the flats. Let's go and chase the girls. Let's, all the things that you needed to do. At, uh, at Mont Gabriel, the, we would bring the chef out on, on Thursday and he would come outside at the top of the lift and he'd set up barbecues and he'd, yes, he'd, yes. And he'd cook chicken and the people in the hotel would get yeah. their meal outside with french fries and chicken and, and out in the sun. Out, outside in the sun or in the snow and the instructor would say to the people, you know, if you give me a buck, each of you, I'll go to the liquor store and I'll buy a gallon of, <laughs> of wine and we'll have some little wine for the barbecue. Well, the chef would always bring out a big, big table full of, of cakes, multiple high cakes <laughs> with whipped cream on the top. And so after a couple of glasses of wine, the instructors would start taking one of the cakes and smash it into the face of one of the other instructors. No. Whoa. Well, that guy would pick up the cake and do they and push it into the other one. Then, the, then they would they be if some instructors would pick on a pretty girl and put a little on her nose or something. <laughs> well, at two o'clock every fun. afternoon we had the rendezvous for the for the, 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 the school the ski school. And these structures would show up the first time covered in cake and, <laughs> and all over their face. And so, so Rudy, who was my assistant director, would, he would start, you guys, you know, he'd yell very loud, you know, like, you yeah, guys, you're a bunch of asses, go out and rub in the snow and get, this, get yourself to look pop. <laughs> so you'd see all these structures take off their skis and roll in the snow. And, and then they'd... And so every Thursday night they have to wash their, 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 their uniform, their jacket. <laughs> and it, it was just fun. It was just fun. Everything was fun. Enjoy. Enjoy. Yeah. And so it was, it was a fun life. It was what I wanted to do. It's what I I wanted to be in that business. Uh, I knew how to make a buck in the air conditioning business, but it was dry. This was making a buck and making having fun. And how did you transfer that fun into the the business? Was to 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 help people to learn faster, I guess. Well, part of our obligation at Mont Gabriel was to do. The, uh, the, the show circuit. The Canadian government and the Quebec government yes, 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 yes. would set up a uh, and pay a portion of the costs 
of setting up booths at the various ski shows. Boston, New York, Canada. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one of the shows, I saw this guy on a piece of cardboard. It was a strip of cardboard, but this wide and about that long. And he would be standing on the cardboard, and they would say, this is a new ski. This is a new ski, ski technique. You, you mm -hmm. swing your body, and you could see that you you could you could, you'd, you'd you'd slide on the on the cardboard. He said, with this technique and these shorts and short skis, you could learn to ski parallel in the first day. And he had a whole sequence of how to do it. So we saw the show in one town, and then we moved to another town, and then we saw the same show. And then we saw it a third time, and after we saw it for a third time, we said, you know, this has got some possibilities. So we, we bought the kit, which was a, a kit of a, some of these cardboard skis that you stand on, and a, a tape recorder, or a cassette, I don't remember if it was a cassette or a tape recorder that, you, that we stood in the machine, and we brought this back to Mont Gabriel, and when Rudy saw it, he went wild. He says, this is what we need. So his enthusiasm got us to convince the uh, ski shop to buy maybe 20 sets of skis. There was 100s, 120s, and 150s. So we bought those three. We got the guy who can buy all these three sizes. Because the standard at that time was 200 and... Right. And more. Yeah. Over. Yeah. So we we convinced the shop to buy it. He bought it and he and all of a sudden when we would when I did the presentation on Sunday night to the ski weekers, I would tell them about this method. I'd tell them how good it is. I'd tell them they would ski parallel the first day and by the end of the week they would be skiing parallel on on their skis, on their very own skis. So they would come down Monday morning and they'd rent skis, so the ski shop got the, got the rental of these skis. And after a while, we started realizing that if somebody was having trouble with their own skis, keeping up with the class, we would go out and take a pair of skis from the ski shop at no charge and give it to this person. They say, wear these skis and you'll see with these skis and your present ability, you're going to be able to ski with, your, with the class that you're in. If you don't want, I can put you to a slower class. But if you want to stay in the class that you're in, put these skis on. And did it work? Absolutely. Really well? Well, the instructor was knew what to do with this person and how, and what and how to teach them most of the time they were doing some kind of a stem turn of, thing, of something but with these skis you could slide the stem and and go around and so they were having some immediate benefit it it helped to keep the classes together different abilities or almost different abilities could stay in the same class uh, it, it just had so many advantages. That, like you said, you were tying two skis together, and with the rope, you would be able. No, I wasn't to tying the skis together. I was tying the, the ankles of this. Of, uh, I had a rope around each ankle, at the boot level. So the skier, in fact, Rudy and I would would take each other out to to learn the technique. This technique of the exactly. rope. Yeah. So. We would put the, 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 the rope around our ankles and, and the person would be in the back. And it, because we knew how to ski, we had too many sensations. We knew what to do. So we would put a, a, a blindfold on. Oh. And the other guy would be on the rope and he would hold the rope and he said, okay, now turn to the right. And, and you, could, you could see that he would turn your skis to the right. Okay, turn to the left. And he would turn, could turn you to the left. And so we perfected this method. I taught my son to ski. I taught my son to ski that way. We started out on 70 centimeter skis at 
two and a half years old. And by three, he was skiing all over the mountain. When he got into the ski sprue at age six, they said to him, um, okay, how do you ski? Show me, you know, how, show, show me your snow plow. He said, I don't know what a snow plow is. He said, I don't know what, what you're talking about. I don't know what a snowplow is. So they put him into a class with beginners. And here it is. He's skiing parallel. And the rest of the class is, is snowplowing. Starting. So I said to the, the guy, I said, I said, you don't have him in the right class. And this guy, happened to time, knew me. And he knew it was my kid. So he says, Stan, you pick the class that you want. You put him in any class you want. So I picked the wrong class. I put him in with Eric Gay, and Eric Gay is a year and a half older than him, or two years older than him. So I put him in that class. At, the, at lunchtime, my son comes to me and says, I think I'm in too fast a class. He go all over the mountain parallel. Mm -hmm. but he couldn't snowplow. When he wanted to stop, he just turned. That's it. Yeah. So there's a, it was a whole different thing that we were doing. It was a whole different sport. Now more people know how to ski because I think you, you help to change that a lot by bringing short skis and way to learn faster and to ski better because I think now the skis are what you did in the 70s are what you aim no the the skis now um, are allowing people with average ability to do something that only a racer could do or somebody with extreme ability. So I, you were talking about that what I was doing but, is, what, is what the skis are today, and I'm saying no. These kids know how to make a ski carve. I knew for 30 years there was such a thing as carving a ski, but I don't believe I ever did it. But you were skiing with Rudy. Rudy knew how to carve a ski, okay? Okay, yeah. But I didn't. Okay. And it's only once we got these parabolic skis that I now learned how to carve a ski. Okay. But the principle is close. Well, if you take the Alliance approach to skiing, They expect that every turn is going to be sliding. So you're sliding like this, and you're sliding, and then you're sliding like this. I'm and you're creating an angle. A steering you're sliding. Angle. The ski is moving sideways across the snow, and you're getting that that feeling of this of the ski oh. sliding. There's a little vibration from the ski sliding across the snow. When you carve a ski, there is no vibration. It's it, you're, you're the, the front of the ski and the back of the ski is going in the same track. And if you load the ski up as you come along, you can load it up so much that at the end of the turn, if you release it, it pops. And it goes. Yeah. Okay, and it pops you into the next turn. And, it, and, and if you ski with this, this kid, that's what they do. She pops every turn. And, and she knows how to pop it to go into the turn, and she knows how to pop it to make it go faster. Mm -hmm. So she can take that pop, she can build that energy up and make that pop and pick up speed. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's a sport that we were not teaching at the time. We, we talked about it, but there was very few people that could do it. Rudy could carve a ski. Yeah, yeah. In the bumps. In the bumps. Yeah. And and not many people could. And Dean, as an example, Dean, one year um, when, when I was at the ski school, we had six guys went up and got a level four in one year from my group, okay? And I kept on saying, I'm not a hot skier. But here it is, six guys went up and got a level four. Rudy was one of them, Dean was another. Um, 
and these were guys that were teaching in my school every single day, and here it is, they all go off and come back with level fours. Mm -hmm. Then we got a, um, we were one of the first places to have a video machine, portable video machine. So we, we were videoing the classes. Are you serious? And what, what year was that? Well, I started there in 69, so it was 69, 70, 71. So we had the video, and we were, we were taking the videos of the skiers and then showing it back to them. We realized that people didn't like to see themselves ski. Okay. They, they felt that they skied better than what it showed. So they weren't happy with that, and I was a little disappointed that we didn't have good success with it initially. But the, the instructors were welcome in the hotel to eat for a dollar in the main dining room. With the clients? With the skiers? With the clients or even without the clients, just to be around. And so they had to wear their, I bought all of them a navy blazer and we put a crest on there and they, they got into the hotel and so this guy wanted to he was he liked to socialize he ha was there with his wife he he was he took a, a year off from his usual job and he wanted to be teaching skiing and she wanted to but I couldn't give her a job and so the two of them would go into the hotel and he realized that the people didn't like to see themselves but they liked to see them but they didn't they they felt they were being criticized or they they didn't look as good as they want and he would make everybody feel good about it so he would sit hours in the lounge talking about it with with the video and the screen and so on and he would he would talk to them and show them and, and uh, so he was having a good time and that made it a little more palatable we always skied the we always videoed the ski race at the end of the ski week yeah. And their people, that was, by that time, they were a little more accustomed to it. They had seen they themselves once or twice during the week. They and by, by the time Friday came along, they were anxious to see themselves in the race. <laughs> After the second year at Mont Gabriel, I, um, I said to the general manager, who I was very good friends with, his name, it was named, he's dead now, Jean Barvots. Yeah. His brother, Guy Barvots, was director of the ski school the year bef the years before me. Okay. And, and Guy was such a good skier that he made the demonstration team with making only one run. They were there to choose the team. They went... And they, they took three days to choose a team. Mm. He got so loaded that he only made <laughs> one run. He made the team with one run. So That's how good. good he was. Yeah. Okay? Every Sunday, he would bring cars in onto the slope. And he had a, 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 a jump built. And the, he'd bring the cars in and he would jump over the cars. Wow. So... He was a real showman. He was and, and so much better than I mean I couldn't even be in his class. I'm not a skier in his class. But mm -hmm. boy. So his brother was a general manager. And I was always concerned that he wished that that his brother was the ski school director. The ski school director, not me, and he kept on saying, My brother brought me nothing but trouble. He <laughs> says and, and he says, and you are taking all my troubles away and you're making things fun for the guests and they're having a good time and says, 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 so he was very appreciative of it and every time he would buy me a drink let's go to the bar and have a drink let's go to this let's go to that so he was glad that he didn't have his brother's troubles there and I took them away and so he and I became quite close after the second year I said this is really fun. It's really working. It's really fun. I said, but I can't make a living here. I said, yeah, I can make a living. I can pay my bills through the winter. I said, I don't want to go take a summer job. 
or if I, I or if I'm going to have some time off and I want to do it and have some fun, go skiing in South America, or I want. I said, I don't, you don't have. I'm not getting. I don't have the money, and I, I'm not earning enough money to live like that. You know, I said, my wife was used to having her own car. Uh, I'd like to have my own car. I'd like to be able to do the. I, I, you can't do the. I didn't. You just couldn't do this on what I was earning there. She said, "So what do you want?" And I said, "I want the ski shop." So that made it so something different. Especially with the GLM, people needed to rent the skis. So, so I, I was supposed to get the ski shop on my second year there. I only got it on the third, um, but when I finally got the, the, the shop and the ski school and the nights, and the, it just everything was starting to come together, and, and I was starting to make some money. I could only earn a living when I had the ski school and the ski shop, and so they bought clothes, they bought... Uh, I had a... I was selling boots. Ski boots. I said to anybody I sell ski boots to, wear them, go skiing three times. And, uh, if you if they don't if you're not happy after if they don't fit you, they're not happy, they're hurting, whatever. If you're not happy after three times, bring them back and give you back your money. I said, I need to know you went skiing three times. You need to bring me three different ski tickets, tickets <laughs> to say that you went out three times. <laughs> so it was just, it was fun. It was just fun. I want to add that the, the ski schools um, And the Ski Alliance is teaching skiing so that people can go out and ski and have fun. But those people that go off and race, like Lindsey Vaughn and... and uh, Laurent Saint-Germain, oh Eric God. Gay. My son was in Eric Gay's class for a while. Yeah. Those people learn a whole different sport. It looks the same to the untrained eye, but it's a whole different sport. And and I think the the alliance has tried to bring the two sports together, but from what I can see, they're not successful. But what the way they're teaching the people to ski in the racing programs it's different it's a whole different sport mm. it and, has to be. and when i was teaching skiing i didn't know that it was a different sport and i didn't i didn't do anything to foster this elite type skiing yeah and so if I had to do it again yeah. I would do it differently yes I, I would I would try to make I would make sure that the fun was still there but I would try to develop these elite skiers I didn't realize that if you're going to c compete with those other kids you just can't ski for four hours every Saturday. Mm -hmm. You're just not going to get there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize it at the time. And so, yeah, if I had to do it again, I'd do some different things. <laughs> but I still believe in the short skis, and I don't think that the schools are using them today enough. Could still 
make the difference between good skiers and carving skiers and you still have that eye, that teaching eye. Yeah, because uh, that's what drove me all these years. I wanted out of this business here, I wanted out of this. To have the... To go skiing, to mm -hmm. do something in skiing. I tried. I yeah. made a little dent, but I didn't I couldn't do it more than that. Why do you say a little dent? Because it's a still a it's, good statement. Well, well it's a gigantic business. I did it a short time. Actually, from the first bus load to the last day that I was in the business was thirteen years. Yeah. What what's your best memory of it or your moment of it of those thirteen years? What are you mostly proud of? Oh, proud? I was going to say the, the barbecue with the chef coming out in his big white hat cooking chicken and the instructors running around with cake and throwing it in everybody's face. And, okay. and we do it every single week. Every week you'd say to the guys, okay, now let's just calm it down this week. Oh, yeah, and oh, yeah we're all going to calm it down. Bam, bam, bam. I didn't start it, you know. <laughs> It's just one laugh after another, one fun. Just never grow up. <laughs> never grow up. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. I thank you.